coming. Welcome to the Whale and Public Library. Uh, I'm really excited tonight to introduce tonight's speakers, Kat Vanderstraiten and Candace Curry, and to have a conversation about the possibilities for alternative endings to our lives. Kat is a community organizer and certified permaculture designer in Wayland, where she's founded several organizations for local resilience. She was trained by Peg Lorenz in after-death body care and has helped several families take care of their loved ones at home. She's a member of Peaceful Passage at Home, which is a group that guides families through the home funeral experience. And she's a scholar in Stephen Jenkinson's Orphan Wisdom School. Candice sits on the board of both the Green Burial Council, an environmental certification organization, and Green Burial Massachusetts, which is an, <coughs> excuse me, an educational and advocacy organization. Prior to this current position, she served as the Director of Planning and Cemetery Development at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Kat and Candice will each present for about 20 minutes, and then we'll save our questions for the end. So please join me in welcoming Kat and Candice. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you to the library for giving us this opportunity to, to present on these two topics um, to our community. Um, they're not your average topics, but they're very worthwhile and, and very thoughtful. And it's, it, I'm, it's great for me to, to talk on them as well. I, I, I'm on this side quite often, and I speak about bees and transition and climate change. So um, you might wonder how I got interested in this. Um, and it happened a couple of years ago that my best friend here in Wayland uh, found out about this movement. And she became uh, intrigued, and then she intrigued me. And uh, we got trained by Peg Lorenz. Um, we did several workshops with her. We invited her to come and speak. And we did some outreach about this. And we educated ourselves and read books. And um, unfortunately, too early on, um, theory had to become practice. And uh, my friend was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and she asked me to uh, be her home funeral uh, guide, to be the guide to her family. Um, and I said yes, of course. So um, my friend was my first home funeral, uh, both as a guide and as a friend. So I saw it from both sides. And the experience I had and the experience that I saw other people having um, was um, it convinced me that this is something that I need to tell people about. And so that's why I'm here. And uh, we call it home funerals. Um, maybe the word home wakes rings more of a bell, because the good old Irish wake between the soup and the potatoes in the, in the living room, right? That people might remember that. Um, we have been doing home funerals as humans for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. It's only a hundred years ago or so that that changed and we started giving some of our, of the care of the bodies of our loved ones away to professionals. There's an intriguing history about that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's only 50 years or so ago that we gave away a lot more of that care. And now we're at a point where all the dead body care is given away to professionals. And we're even at a point when people think it's not legal, it's not possible, and it's never been done to do a home funeral. I mean, they would be wrong uh, on all scores. So that's what this is about. So it's really about reclaiming an old, beautiful tradition and offering a choice. It's not like we're saying everyone needs to do a home funeral. But we want people to understand that it definitely is a choice of that they can make. So I work with Peaceful Passage at Home, um, which was founded by Peg Lorenz, and she's also the person who trained us. And still guides us. There's five of us, six of us, and there's uh, two of my colleagues in the room. So if I don't know the answer to a question, I'll call on them. <laughs> so um, <coughs> let's just get this one out of the way first, the legalities. Embalming is not required by law. Uh, this is something that people may tell you, and, and that is just not true. It's perfectly legal to keep the deceased at home. Usually that's for one to three days. I've heard of four days, even five days. It depends on the body and the situation. In most cases, it is legal to bring uh, the deceased home from either uh, a care facility or a hospital. It's not always easy because um, a lot of people in these facilities don't know that this is legal. So you have to convince them, you have to advocate. 
And at the time of death, it's not an easy thing to do, but still it's possible. And we had a case just a couple of weeks ago where, where they managed to get their loved one out of the hospital and home for a home funeral. Um, and then a family member or any designated agent or uh, person can fill out all the paperwork. Um, you need some other people to help with that as well. And can also transport uh, the body to the final resting place. So all those things are perfectly legal. So does this apply just to Massachusetts? Yes. Law? This is in Massachusetts, and, and it depends on from state to state. And there's a great book here, Final Rights, which you can come and have a look at, um, which lays it all out state by state. So some states are a lot more strict. Massachusetts is a great state for all humans. Still, though, not everyone knows about it, and uh, you need to be educated. Uh, home funerals also won't break the bank. Uh, that might not be something on our minds in this room, but personally, I feel this is also a social equity issue. And I have been at, counts, um, um, at um, consultations with families before death about home funeral who would absolutely would have had to go in debt to have a conventional funeral. Mm -hmm. And so um, if people want to have a home funeral just because they can't afford a conventional funeral, that's just fine by me. Um, people should be able to not have to go into debt for a funeral. These are numbers from 2011. So inflate as much as you want. Uh, it's just to compare it to this. Um, my friend's home funeral was not counting the burial plot and, and the services from the uh, cemetery uh, organization was $475. That's how much it cost to give her a home funeral. So it's perfectly legal. It won't break the bank. It's perfectly practical as well, and possible. So the first thing you think about a home funeral, person dies, you want to keep them at home, and then you want to take them to the burial or cremation site. The first thing you think about, of course, is how do I take care of the body? And body care is, is of course, at the center of this. Um, this includes washing, clothing or shrouding, and posing. So you want to keep close the eyes, keep the mouth closed, and all of that. Um, you also want to keep the body cool. That's very important. Uh, we see a lot of cases where people see a dead body and they feel cold and they put quilts on or, or blankets. Right? That's not what we want to do. So we want to keep the body cool. And um, fu uh, funeral directors, and home, home funeral directors, or home funeral guides, they would uh, use, um, what's that called? Uh, dry ice to do this in, in the past which you can imagine that was not easy to do, but still possible. Nowadays, though, we have this great um, thing that was, people use lunch boxes. <laughs> it's called uh, Techni Ice. It's just these packs. So they're full of gel. You just stick them in a bucket. The gel absorbs the water. You stick them in the freezer, and they become ice packs. And so we put these under the body in certain places. And, and as they defrost, we swap them out for new ones. And as the body cools down over the couple of days, you have to swap them out less and less. So it became super easy to do this. And uh, you know, if it's in the middle of summer, it's sweltering, you might want to borrow or rent like one of these um, portable air conditioners. But on the whole, you just want a cool room, so you crack the window. And that, that, is, that is typically it. That's what one has to do. So, so what's the target temperature? Ha, huh, good question. I, yeah, 65 degrees room in a room. Yeah. Would be sort of ideal for the high. 65, yeah. Lower than 65 would be good too. Which is pleasant for people who are with the body as well. Um, so practically, one has to take care of, of the body, of course. Um, and as home funeral guides, when we come and consult with families who want to do this, we, we tell you everything, all the details, that, more details about this, this process. Um, it's not because it's a home funeral that you don't have to do paperwork. <laughs> you, you have to do the paperwork. Um, the paperwork involves other people. 
Um, if you do a conventional funeral, the funeral director takes care of everything. Right? He takes over, he goes to the doctor and gets um, uh, the beginnings of the death certificate. He has a way of getting into uh, the Massachusetts system that then gives him um, the death certificate, the burial permit, um, and the transport permit. So he takes care of all of that and you don't see this. If you do this at home, if you have, if you want to take on the paperwork yourself, you have to consult with your doctor or, or um, hospice so they know that you're doing home funeral. You have to consult with the town clerk because because you don't have access to that statistic system, on Mass the Massachusetts statistic system, um, the town clerk now needs to do that. So it's always great to go and talk to your town clerk in advance. Because many town clerks have not ever, ever done this uh, before. My friend here in Wayland, she was the first in, in memory of um, the town administration. We went to talk to them beforehand. We made sure that this was coming, that they knew that this, this was coming, and uh, that they had some training. It's, it's really not an easy system for the town clerk. Lots of screens. A lot of things can go wrong. So you don't want to stress those people out. Um, but legally, they have to do this for you. This is a service they have to give you. And many town clerks are quite open. And in our group, we have made contact with several town clerks around Massachusetts who can help a town clerk who doesn't know about this figure it out. So we have a network of support for our town clerks. So we have the doctor or hospice nurse, we have the town clerk, um, we need a burial permit and a burial permit requires a burial agent in the town to also make a piece of paper. Usually in, in Wayland that's the Board of Health. Uh, it could be a separate person or it could, usually it's the Board of Health. So you want to get, talk to them as well. And you want to talk to your cemetery director because he needs to know that you're coming with your van, not the people they're usually used to deal with. It's great to let those people know beforehand. And if that happens, uh, the paperwork is fine. And a lot of families have done the paperwork themselves. We again can guide people with that. However, if you just don't want to deal with paperwork, and it's a tough time, then we have found some funeral directors who will take on that bit. So they'll charge you for that bit, just the paperwork. This is ex these are exceptional people, and, and I want to shout, give a shout out to them. Um, usually um, funeral directors will not uh, cut a piece out of their package. They want to give you the whole package. But so we've found two or three people who are willing to do just the paperwork. And the same for the transportation. Um, you are entirely allowed to transport the body, if you have a transport and burial permit, yourself. Um, but again, this is something that you might not want to do. Um, we had a um, home funeral on the evening of last year's Super Bowl. And uh, it was freezing rain, and, and it was just not possible to, to uh, move the body themselves. And so we called up the funeral director, and he said, yeah, I'll do it, which is awesome on that day. Um, so, and they, again, <laughs> charge a small fee and they can take that out of your hands. So we're moving, see this is the thing about choice, it's not between either full-on home funeral or full-on conventional. We are hybridizing, we're working together um, to give all these choices in between. So that's becoming a lot more available now. Sometimes in the winter, I don't know if you knew this, um, some town cemeteries do not have the equipment to defrost the ground. And then the body cannot be buried if you're looking at a burial. In that case, the body usually goes into storage. And obviously, that cannot happen at home. Um, and in that case, too, uh, we found funeral homes that will take the body and take care of that as well. Well, you can still have a home funeral. So it's entirely practical as well to do this. And many people in Massachusetts and in these states have, have done it. Um, <coughs> A little bit about bodies and disease. Um, a dead body is not contagious. Um, these are the specialists. <laughs> we have not at any point prescribed embalming, for instance, as a method of protecting public health. So embalming definitely is not necessary legally or for health reasons. 
And then the microorganisms that are involved in decomposition are not the kind that cause disease. Most viruses and bacteria that do cause disease cannot survive more than a few hours in the tent well. <coughs> So it's practical and perfectly doable. It's perfectly legal. Uh, legal. It won't break the bank, and um, it's not dangerous to the living, to their health. So those are all the reasons, all the possible reasons that shouldn't stop you from doing a whole thing. But what are the reasons for doing it, for having one? So imagine um, in a conventional situation. Uh, you've taken care of someone for months, maybe. You've dressed them, you've fed them, you've talked with them, you've touched them for months. And now they've died. And that is, that's big, you know it. Right. That's just, convention, in a conventional situation, you call your doctor or hospice, they come and pronounce the death. Within the hour, a funeral director comes, and respectfully puts the body in a body bag and takes them away. And then the next time you see them, they are in the casket at viewing hours in the funeral apartment. That's the conventional situation. In this situation, the person dies, it's big. You call up your doctor or your hospice nurse, they come and pronounce the death, they leave, then you call us. We come with our kit, with our techni eyes. You can call us within the hour, within two hours is, is best. And we help you dress and wash and put the ice on your loved one. In the meantime, you can invite somebody else to come and you know, your uh, daughters or sons or sisters to come and help as well. And we do this together. And it, on average, it takes one to two to three hours to get the body ready for the wake part. Then we leave, and then you have one, two, three days to take your time. And um, I've been there, and it's beautiful. Yeah, Lisa, can I just add from my perspective, um, as a home funeral guide, my preference would be that you don't even need me to come. That yes. you can, my role is to try to empower you to do it all yourself, but then of course we are available. Yes. Like Kat was just describing. Yeah. If you choose that. Yeah, yeah I'll have a little bit about that. So it's in an intimate setting, it's in your usual surrounding. It's on your own time. Uh, it's really good for grieving and healing and saying goodbye. You give your friends and your family work to do. Very important at this time. People want to do stuff. And there is work to do. There's flowers to arrange. There's food to be put in the fridge. Um, there's decorations to be put up. There's people to be welcomed. A lot of work to do. Um, it's simply another choice. It's not for everyone. Again, this is a typical situation. But you can imagine there are situations when a home funeral is just not possible. And again, we can advise on that. And like I said, uh, these hybrid home funerals, funeral homes, um, are becoming more available to make it just easier. <coughs> so what does it look like? I have a couple of pictures now, and, and there are some dead bodies in the pictures, and they're beautiful. Um, if anyone is sensitive to that, um, you could even we'll call you back. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure. It is the case that many who have taken care of their loved ones just, they can't call someone within the hour, they're gone. I mean, the shock of that, it's, it's traumatic. It's not good for grieving. And so many people um, in that situation choose for home funerals. Um, and again, for, for a child to wash their parents and to clothe them is, is powerful. For a parent to wash their child is, of course, also. So. And then, so after the body is ready, it's in your own home. You can make the decorations. You make that environment as you wish. Um, it's entirely your free to do that. 
And then friends and family can come and they too can take their time to say goodbye. It's powerful for kids too. I, I was at my friend's wedding, uh, my friend's funeral, um, her grandson. It was very um, powerful for him to see her after she had died. And he was not afraid at all. So for children too, it's, it's very um, important to see them. And then, um, you know, while people are at the wake inside, if it's a nice day outside, you, uh, you bring the box out. And we have available these uh, uh, cremation boxes. Uh, again, they're 100 bucks. Um, they are made of a wooden platform or a tray, and then the box is made of cardboard and goes on top. That's all you need. And the cardboard takes to decorate. And people go out and they paint and leave messages on the box. Some people even make um, a wooden box. This, is, this was my friend's box being made uh, here in Wales. And uh, wonderful stories are shared. So this is the box, her box at the end. 21 people laid hands on it. 21 people built this box. And the stories you wouldn't believe. Uh, promises made to one another. I want this too, right? Like, I'll remember. Um, gorgeous, a gorgeous time when you have time. This is a beautiful, uh, this is again one of the wooden, uh, one of the cardboard boxes. It's just a cardboard box. And you might think, or people might think like, oh well, you know, we want the fancy caskets and all that. Well, how beautiful is this, right? It's unique, <coughs> biodegradable, lovingly made by many, many hands, and hundred dollars. So um, then you are legally allowed to transport your body. So this is one of those. Again, you give people work to do. This person actually, same person, wanted to be taken to his last resting place in, in his favorite truck. Mm -hmm. And there it is. This is another home funeral. Do you see any hippies here? <laughs> no hippies here. I'm going to see one. These are perfectly respectful people. Um, don't let anyone malign them for doing this beautiful act for their loved one, which is full of dignity and respect and, and responsibly, responsibly done as well. So don't let anyone say that home funerals is only for hippies and alternative types. <laughs> <coughs> so how we work with families at Peaceful Passage at Home um, there are several home funeral guides in Massachusetts, so we only work within a certain range. Um, if you live elsewhere or in a different state, we are connected to others, so we can find home funeral guides who do the same work as we do for you. Uh, this is how we work. Um, we love to consult, we actually really much prefer to consult with families before death. Uh, we like to meet um, everyone who will be there at the home funeral and who is a decision maker. It's not good to walk into a house where people have not been informed that this is what we'll be doing and you have to start the educating then. Uh, so ideally we meet with families prior to death to set expectations, to see whether it's possible to do this, uh, to answer any concerns from family. Um, and then we help them create, the families create their own plans. And we also help, again, with communicating with the doctor, the town clerk, the board of health, and the cemetery director, and any other officials. We do that as well. At the time of death, if the family feels they need support, and like Lisa said, they may not, at, at this point, they may feel empowered and formed enough to do this by themselves, and that happens. But if they feel um, that they need our support, we are on call, night and day, and we can come. Uh, and in that case, we like to come within an hour to two hours after death. Uh, and then we help and just guide. We, we like to be hands off because this is something the family needs to do. Uh, but we'll, you know, we'll arrange for gel packs. And, and then throughout the vigil, we are available by phone if there are any questions. And again, if you really feel like we need to be there, we can be there. We can come. And uh, does that cost an arm and a leg? Uh, 
Um, no, uh, we charge a small honorarium for the consultation before death. We don't ask any fees for the services after death. We do like to ask for donations because this is important work we're doing. We're all volunteers and we like to keep offering these services. We also offer educational services, that is we do stuff like this. And uh, we actually also offer a hands-on workshop where you learn to uh, close a mouth and turn a person to put the techni eyes on her. This is actually my friend. This is a workshop she had organized many years ago. Um, so workshops usually take four hours with the, you know, the theory and then the practice. And this is peaceful passage at home, the things we do in Eastern and Central Massachusetts. And again, as members of the National Home Funeral Alliance, we are in that network, so we can help people in other uh, places as well. And I have some um, flyers here with that address on the screen. Did I cover <laughs> Yeah. That's all I have. So maybe we'll take questions after? Yeah. After Candice, please? Thank to come here to, to Wayland tonight, and I'm here on behalf of Green Burial Massachusetts, and what we provide is education and advocacy work, and we're often invited out to libraries or cemetery commissions or senior centers to give a talk about traditional burial, burial in the ground without a concrete box, and uh, surprisingly enough, it's news to people. This kind of burial is news. And we are run by uh, a group of us volunteers, and it's a, a nonprofit that we formed in 2016. And we're also working with land trusts to establish perhaps a conservation cemetery, which means you might be driving by and you might see a beautiful meadow or some fabulous wooded area but there are no headstones. But in fact, you can use your body in a meadow or in a field like that to help conserve the land. So we're working with land trusts to try to identify parcels of land where we can do that. And someone recently asked me, well, why doesn't a land trust just you know, donate some of their land for that purpose? Well, in fact, land trusts don't typically own land. They take care of or they manage some part of the land that maybe the special salamander or special amphibian of, uh, or special species of trees that, that they need to oversee. So we need to find some new parcels of land that's not farmland, that's not wetland, that can be dug with a shovel and can be used for natural burial. So it, it's, it's taking two of the executive directors I've been working with have both said, wow, this is taking longer than I thought it was going to take. So we've been at it for several years now. My inspiration for natural burial came from this guy named Jacob Bigelow. And he was one of the co-founders of Mount Auburn Cemetery, where I worked for 20 years. And in 1825, he wrote a paper called The Discourse on the Burial of the Dead. And he delivered that paper. This was before the founding of Mount Auburn Cemetery. But what he said is, the elements which have once lived, moved, and circulated in living frames do not become extinct nor useless after death. They offer themselves as the materials from which other living frames are to be constructed. So you know, this living frame can become this living frame, right? A, a tree or some other type of uh, fern or an apple tree. So 
the idea that you know all these decades, 60 plus years, I've been using the fruits and the vegetables that are coming out of the earth. Well, now I want to use my body to, to help rejuvenate a new something. That's what this natural burial is about. And I think Jacob Bigelow perfectly summed it up there. Most, most cemeteries across the state might have a back 40, and these concrete boxes might be waiting to go into a grave. Some cemeteries open up new sections, and they pre-install these concrete boxes because it makes it easier to dig the grave when it's time to do the burial. And it helps keep the lawn smooth. That's the purpose of these concrete boxes, is to keep the lawn smooth. It's not about protecting groundwater. In fact, some of these things actually have holes in the bottom of them so that things can move back and forth. So it's primarily about keeping the lawn flat. Yeah, surprising, right? Distasteful. Distasteful, yes, I agree. Um, and lowering devices. So, um, and notice these, these, this is in a conventional cemetery, these are referred to as the greens, right? It's fake green covering up the metal pieces around the bottom of this frame. And in this particular case, we have a, a vault. And this vault has been designed so that once the casket goes into the vault, this thing is sealed on top of the casket. So basically, the casket's going inside a casket that's going inside the grave. Versus a natural burial, a lowering device could be something simple like these ropes and these wooden planks. And the family gets to do the lowering of the body into the grave. And much like a home funeral, a home wake helps with the grieving process, so does the involvement with the family, being able to do this process themselves. I've been able to witness that, that this, this helps. So we're going to spend a, a time to watch a 13-minute video from Steelman Town Cemetery, which is in southern New Jersey. Southern New Jersey feels an awful lot like Cape Cod. And last year, I, I visited Steelman Town with a group from Plymouth. Plymouth is also looking to create a natural burial ground. And um, so it was really fun to, to, to visit this particular cemetery. ceased to exist. For many, many years, my mom had a real heavy heart about my brother being buried here. And uh, she wanted to move him, but he had been buried in a wicker basket. So, you know, she'd been told there wouldn't be anything left. I'm a developer, and I came out here to look at the land adjacent to the cemetery. And I decided to go over and take a look at my brother's grave. And quite honestly, I was in shock of the condition of the cemetery. It had been a few years since I had been back here. It become literally a dumping ground. So I went to, the, to this gentleman who was elderly, and I said, you know, listen, you have to do something about this. You have to clean it up. And uh, he said, you know, I, uh, I don't have any money. I, I'm not physically able. And he made the proposition that he would give me the cemetery. So I, I went home, and I told my wife, you know, and my wife's an attorney, and she said, are you, you, know, are you crazy? Uh, and I said, well, no, somebody needs to be responsible for this place. You know, it, it, you know, they really did. 
So uh, I took him up on his offer, and not knowing really what I had, because uh, I didn't know this natural burial movement. Now I still at that point had no clue really what I was getting myself into, because I found new life at the cemetery. It had come full circle. But uh, until I experienced that first burial, I realized that uh, I didn't choose this, this chose me. after I took ownership, uh, I had read an article in the Atlantic City Press about natural burial and uh, realized, geez, you know, I meet all this criteria. It was really quite unbelievable. And I, and I truly, at one point someone said this was meant to be, and I, at this point in my life I, I do believe that that's true. So uh, I contacted the Green Burial Council and became certified, and uh, we're only one of, uh, you know, around a dozen uh, natural burial grounds certified natural burial grounds in the country. Okay. All righty. Cool. We're proud to be a part of and, and glad to be a part of that. It's a, it's a whole different kind of funeral. Um, it, al it allows people to be more involved or, or I guess it, it almost welcomes people to be more involved in, in the process. But it seems families that select that want to be a little more involved in what's going on. So we, we offer to people if they want to help dress their loved one, they're able to do that. Um, it allows people to be interred without a casket if that's what they would like. So just wrap in a shroud or Distressed, wrapped it in a blanket or quilt or something like that. Um, if they select a casket, it has to be biodegradable. So either like a wicker casket or pine box. Green burial is nothing new. It's the way it was done way for centuries and before the Civil War. Civil War is what made embalming 
and necessary evil so that the sons of soldiers could get from the south to the north and still be waked and buried as, as usual. Green burial is very affordable. In most cases, it's less costly than a traditional burial. Although that's not truly what appeals to people for the most part. It's more of a mindset that you want to be returned to the earth. To see a green burial and people coming away feeling like they're celebrating life as opposed to upset about death is a wonderful thing. When you're here and the birds are singing and you realize that there's still a life pattern that happens and with the hand dug graves and, and the people that backfill in the graves for their loved one, it's just so much more tangible and yet satisfying. is about life, not about death. I mean, all you have to do is look around you and you're surrounded by life. And that's what it should be. This should be a happy place. Death is, you know, obviously is, you know, very painful. But uh, this can ease the pain. It can make you want to come back and visit your loved ones by giving the family the control back, by taking the family and from being the spectator and, and giving the, empowering them to be the participants again it, I've realized that it's really become a, real, a, a very cathartic, very healing process. It's not for everyone, but for those of us who love the outdoors, love the woods, choose a simpler end to our lives, this is a one-of-a-kind place. But maybe I'll be fodder for the next pine tree to come back. All you can hope for is a, a send-off that leaves people feeling happy that they knew you instead of almost sad that you're gone. So many fond memories of your mother. She was great. Sherry was my friend and my neighbor and my partner in crime. People come here uh, to use this while they're living. Uh, it, it tends to make them understand that maybe this is a place where they might want to be in death. But when these people come and they're distraught and crying, and they are able to actively participate, they run the gamut of emotions. They 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 cry. They get angry. They laugh. And in the end, they look at me and they say, "Thank you," and they have a smile on their face. And what does that say? I mean that that's a you know that that's that that tells me that we're doing we're doing something really special. It is very rewarding. Um, and that that's you know people people are suffering and and to to have them come up afterward and give me a big hug and say thank you to have them feel that that gratefulness for what we did, that means everything as well. That's why I do it. Not, not for recognition, but just because we help them and they can move on for the most part and feel good about the decisions that they made. Coming to me, Denise, and, and you know, the services that we provided for them. I'm glad I did what I did, and it's changed my life forever. And uh, and hopefully, you know, we can reach people and, uh, and make them understand that they do have the choice. This is a this is a viable option, and you know, I think it's a good one.
family comes to visit me here, they'll know I'm here because this is my environment. This is, you know, teaching children about the environment. This is what I've done for many years of my life and been in the woods and just loving the change of seasons and the flora and the fauna and everything that goes with it. So they will get a sense that I'm still here. buried next to her. So they're all looking over the path. And Stillman Town, New Jersey isn't the only place where there are natural burial grounds. Ramsey Creek in South Carolina was where the first one opened up most recently in 1998. And in a natural burial ground, these are the greens evergreen boughs that get put over a grave. And notice also that the grave is mounded up. And so as the casket or the shrouded body decomposes like it's supposed to, the mound will level out and eventually the plants will grow in and it will look like a flat place again. And you won't perhaps even notice there's a grave there. Unlike the conventional cemeteries, the lawn cemeteries that we're used to, they use those boxes so it won't collapse. But even then, because the soil has been decompressed when they dug the grave and then put soil back on, at Mount Auburn Cemetery, there was still always some little topping off that had to get done every spring or perhaps every fall. And then it would be reseeded with lawn again. That's the reason for using those concrete boxes. And I was curious when Mount Auburn Cemetery started to use the boxes, and why really did they start to use them? And so I went looking through the archives and found out that it was about the 1940s they started using these concrete boxes. But in fact, they were more sections of concrete for the sides and then for the top. And they did it because there were two other cemeteries doing it. And they were all doing it to try to save money, save money from doing the topping off. So it, it it really was about maintenance. I thought it might also have something to do with heavier equipment was being used in the cemetery starting in the 40s. You know, tractors were starting to become bigger and more powerful. But I couldn't find a correlation between those two things. Although, they definitely, somebody who works in a cemetery will tell you that they're using these boxes so that they don't collapse. And occasionally there might be a collapse, but even in the <coughs> old days there still might be a collapse. So it, it, it still happens, but the primary purpose is landscape maintenance. And it's not just, you know, the hippie, crunchy granola types. Um, veterans are also interested in natural burial. There is a, a veteran cemetery in California and a couple in Colorado that are piloting green burial sections in the veteran cemeteries right now. And about 10 years ago, Green Springs outside Ithaca, New York was created. 
And there's a woman who, who lives in this neck of the woods who purchased a lot out in Green Springs. And she told her daughter about it. And the daughter said, well, I don't want to travel for 10 hours to go bury you. And so in fact, they came to Mount Auburn Cemetery where we had a selection of natural burials. And she decided to be buried there. Even though at Mount Auburn Cemetery, most of those graves do not allow any kind of marker. You get a little number for your grave, but you don't get a marker of stone or even a piece of granite. And that's Mount Auburn's design to, to do it that way. There is one section where they have a listing stone of a bunch of people who are 15 people who, who are laid out in natural burial graves who can be on a listing stone. But at Mount Auburn Cemetery, it's about the look and the feel and the character of the cemetery. It's about the trees and the existing hardscape that's already there. The monuments, the obelisks, the, uh, some of the beautiful craftsmanship that happened in the 1800s that you can still view at Mount Auburn. So these natural burial graves are integrated between some of those old monuments. So if you need a, a touchstone to get to your grave, maybe you can recognize somebody else's spot. And also, if you do want to have your name somewhere, <coughs> it can go on a tree. You can sponsor a tree and, and have a memorial label on a tree. But all these cemeteries are different. They can all make up their rules. And one of the things Greenville, Massachusetts is just starting to do is keep track of all the cemeteries across the state. So towns could have more than one cemetery. And we've just started to keep track of who's really allowing green burial. Um, <coughs> it doesn't allow non-residents as well as residents. And so we don't have this up on our website yet, but we will in the next few months. And so right now, here's a, a list of where green burials are allowed. And Sadly, Wayland is not one of them. Um, does anybody know what Wayland's requirements are? <laughs> yeah, cat knows. Um, well, um, these requirements were created in 2014, these, these updated requirements. And um, they're, they're quite strict. In fact, um, the first thing highlighted, it is required that all full earth burials, so that would be all body burials, must be made in a puncture-proof and rigid outer burial vault constructed of reinforced concrete, steel, copper, or other proven material normally used in the construction of vaults that is designed to resist deterioration. How does that strike you? Why? 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> See, I'm new to Wayland. I don't know if that's true or not. And the second one, all vaults shall be installed under the direct, under the direction of the Department of Public Works. After the burial, the cover must be installed immediately by the vault company under the direction of the funeral director. So even though Kat was telling you that. Um, it's perfectly legal in Massachusetts for you to bring your own family member to the cemetery, for you to lower your own family member into the ground. It's not legal in the Whalen Cemetery right now. These are the um, rules and regulations put together. It says, issued by the Public Works and Department of Public Works, acting as a cemetery commission. So evidently, there's no full-fledged cemetery commission in, in Wayland. It, it's all handled by the um, Department of Public Works. So this is the other reason why it's really important if, if you have a family member who's dying to talk to the cemetery, to talk to your funeral director, to get your plans in order so you're not faced with this when you say, oh my goodness, my loved one said he or she wanted a green burial, but now they can't have one. Um, so it's important to plan ahead. And I just want to note, even though we're not talking strictly about cremation, but also for cremated remains, urns for cremated remains must withstand a minimum of 20 years within the ground and withstand heavy equipment moving over the burial site of the urn. 
I was shocked by that one. Um, I have seen vaults required in other cemeteries, but um, and then a little further on it says this concept of a Mackenzie urn. I had to look that up. It's, it's, an, it's an urn made of granite or stone or something really heavy duty. So because people often think cremation is, is green, and it's sort of the second greenest option, but it does use, in most cases, natural gas to fuel the cremation chamber for about two to four hours at 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really hot. And um, the federal EPA produces standards, and then the state DEP enforces those standards. And there are toxins released into the air. So even though <coughs> the urn, let's say it could only needs a one foot by foot, one foot, two foot in the ground to, to bury an urn, you're still releasing something into the, out of the, the smokestack, out of the chimney. Some greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, lead, nitrogen, oxide, hydrogen fluoride, as well as if you have dental fillings, the mercury from your fillings is vaporized and that too is going out. So while it takes a smaller footprint in size, not necessarily in the outer pollution of the cremation. Now what's happening here? Does anybody know? These happen to be paper mache like boxes that hold cremated remains and they're being thrown off so it's sort of a burial at sea. So that is also a, a legal way to handle your cremated remains. So the things that aren't green, and the reason why I show this slide is because everything we're putting into the ground in the conventional cemetery right now, so it could be 20 million board feet, this is every year, 20 million board feet of hardwood. So that, imagine it's a, a, a redwood or teak or some beautiful casket. Well, you know, why are we gonna bury that? Um, 1.6 million tons of concrete, 17,000 tons of copper and bronze, 64,000 tons of steel, and then embalming fluid. So the concrete, just as an example, every year we could build, we could go halfway across the, the continent of the U.S. on a two-lane highway because of what we're putting into the ground. And it's just, none of it's necessary. That's what's shocking to me about these things, that none of them are necessary. Mark Harris wrote this book called Grave Matters, and it's about 10 years old now. And I was working at Mount Auburn Cemetery when this book came out. And for those of you who haven't been to Mount Auburn Cemetery, it's stunningly beautiful. It's a botanic garden, as well as beautiful hills and valleys, and there really is a Mount Auburn. And at the top of Mount Auburn, you can get a 360 degree view of everything around it, including great views of uh, Boston. <coughs> so it's a sacred place to me. And yet Mark Harris refers to conventional cemeteries as toxic waste grounds. I thought, oh my God, how can he say that about Mount Auburn Cemetery? But in fact, it's true. Mount Auburn, I'm sure, has buried people in the concrete boxes and has buried embalmed people because that's our convention these days. That's the way most people are handling their death. So it's been an eye-opener for me to work from, I went from the horticulture department and became a cemeterian. And um, so I'm now such an advocate for, for green burial. And that's what brings me here tonight. So what is it? Everything going into the ground is biodegradable. Simple. This is Foxfield Preserve in Ohio. Typically, it involves a flat marker. We saw Ed Bixby in the video just now. He was holding a stone. That stone came from his property. It was engraved with Sherry's name on it. Down in Steelman Town, you may have noticed the soil was really sandy, and they opened the grave by hand, and they closed the grave by hand. 
Many other cemeteries here in the Northeast do not do that. They still use equipment even in the natural burial grounds. Ed will also, he does winter burials, but he will put some type of hot coals or a box over the grave area so that they can actually dig it. So they defrost it a little bit before they start digging. There is a state law in New Jersey that graves had to be five feet deep. But typically for natural burials, they're three and a half to four feet deep. So people often say, well, what, isn't that going to be dug up by a wild animal? And uh, no, there are no reports of that. And that's because, you know, if you've never noticed, a, a, say, a fox or a coyote's tracks, they're all going to go, ch -ch -ch -ch, right? There's a beeline. They're going somewhere. So their nose can smell roadkill or something else that's a lot easier to get to than three and a half feet below the ground. So we don't have enough meat on this to make it worthwhile for them to dig it. So they're not going to go after you in the ground. Uh, we saw. Wouldn't that be green? <coughs> Excuse me? Wouldn't that be green? <laughs> yes, it, it would in fact be green if, if they wanted to go for it. And so there, there's uh, sky burials. Have you heard of sky burials? Um, that's in, in the, I think it's the Tibetan cultures where the body goes out and is sort of um, attached to a boulder or a rock or something, and vultures come and take the body away. And that's, that's what they do. Uh, low density, 1 to 200 burials per acre versus a higher density, 1 to 2,000 burials per acre. And I say this is controversial. Um, <clears throat> my experience has been People who have created the natural burial grounds that came from the conservation um, mindset, they only want to put in one to two burials, one to two and a big yeah, burials per acre. Uh, people like me who have come from the cemetery world, they're much more aligned with this higher density within the cemetery. So imagine a whole bunch of white crosses in a veteran cemetery. That's closer to the one to 2,000 burials per acre. And, and the reason why I think it's okay, typically we're not doing so many burials every day that we're not overpowering the soil with our bodies. There's enough microbiota happening in the, in the soil and the microorganisms can handle what we're giving it. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that we can have higher density of burials. And also the fact that burials, one might be in the back 40, another one might be close by. So they can be spread out. They don't have to be one after the other. Environmental reasons people are choosing this. Spiritual and philosophical reasons. Do-it-yourselfers, I know a guy who's built his coffin, which is currently his bookcase. <laughs> you can find plans online if you would like to build your own bookcase. And it, it's typically cheaper. So, Kat, come on back and we're happy to answer questions. So what's being done in Milan to change the rules? Uh, not much yet. We're gearing up to change the rules. Yes, there, there's been talk about it. Um, I hadn't read that very closely myself yet, so I was pretty shocked <coughs> at yeah, the end. strange. But um, if you're interested in working on this <laughs> with, with us, then yeah, you know, it's good. To I mean, it's obviously written by someone that had the kind of Kool Aid, if you like. Of, Yes. And, and usually um, that kind of um, reaction or overreaction comes, in this case, I think from environmental reasons, not to want to pollute the groundwater. So this is what we would have to address, that what you're putting in also pollutes the groundwater or even more sickness. So we'll be working with Cavs with all the details. Right. And we, we will, at some point in the near future, approach the deep dolly um, rules in this case. Good. 
Lots of luck, as Abby said. <laughs> you have luck on yourself. You have lots of family plots, you know, on your own property in Wayland. Um, it's possible, yeah, and those were actually the state laws, right? That's not, um, I don't think that's addressed in I, I didn't address, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it depends on the town, and the Board of Health will have to approve it on your town, and there are certain requirements you need to be, I think it's 200 feet from a, a public water supply or a private well, as well as a septic system. And you need to plot it out on a map, and it needs to show up on your deed. So your realtor may not like you when you go to sell your property because they're like, oh no, you have a cemetery on your property, but it's too bad. Um, <laughs> if, if you have the acreage, it, it's possibly legal. It, it certainly is in the state, but each town will, will have their own regulation. And it also takes some time to make it possible. So yes. This is definitely a work in advance yeah. type of planning. And I, I wanted to make a comment too that in the video, Denise and Bob Fertig were the funeral directors there. It wasn't a home funeral, right? They were a funeral director who, like all funeral directors, they go to school to learn embalming. That's what they learn. So it's a rare breed uh, uh, that they were doing that. And as Kat said, there's a few around here that will be helpful. And when Mount Auburn Cemetery started selling the natural graves to people, we had to find some funeral directors who could do and help prepare the body naturally. Uh, that they, they, it was foreign to them. And um, so in fact, we had a couple people like Kat come in, and we had five of our most frequented uh, funeral directors have a, a lunch together, talk about death care at home. And one of the funeral directors said, oh, I don't need to learn that. And one of the other funeral directors said, hey, you know, natural burial today is what cremation was 15 years ago. you got to get on board if you want your business to survive. So it, it's an education process for, for funeral directors as well as Mount Auburn Cemetery team. There's an interment crew. They, Mount Auburn does 500 burials a year. So that's a lot of death that these guys are seeing all the time. So when I first asked them, you know, will you handle a shrouded body because I want this Mount Auburn to be certified by the Green Burial Council, which can certify cemeteries and funeral products and funeral homes. And they said, oh, no, 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 Candace, we, we, we don't want to touch a shrouded body because they were worried about leakage. And much like the crematory at Mount Auburn Cemetery, if there's body leakage, the crematory manager calls the crematory calls the funeral director and says, hey, you have to take your body back and prepare it again and bring it back to the crematory. And so we made the same rule for natural burial. So if the funeral director brings a body and it's been shrouded and the show's leakage, then the... What does that mean? What does that mean? Perhaps you would like to address the leakage issue. Um, well, so, yeah, this is something we address at the beginning of uh, right after death is that um, there could be leakage of uh, stool or urine, and we are trained in dealing with that, just as I assume funeral directors are trained right as well. Um, and there's ways of dealing with that. Yeah. So the interment crew said to me, oh, no, 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 we're going to put on our personal protective gear if we have to handle a shrouded body. And I said, oh, please don't do that. And so, We've managed to get around that, and the the bottom of a uh, the, the, like a shrouding board. It's uh, Kat showed a picture of a, a coffin that was cardboard, and it's wood on the bottom. That is being used to transport a shrouded body if if somebody wanted to be shrouded. And Mount Auburn tells the family, look, we're going to put the body in the ground with this board on the bottom. Is that okay? And they've always said yes. And there's never been a problem with body leakage either. So it's, it's, a, it's a fright that they, that they responded to, but it doesn't typically happen. Yes? Pine was used here. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you use hardwood? Why wouldn't you be able to use hardwood? Theoretically. Yeah, um, you, could, you could use an oak tree as a hardwood, for example. 
but um, it takes longer to decompose. And uh, for a natural burial, you might want to. Um, promote, I'm just asking theoretically. Promote, promote the decomposition rather than. But if it takes longer, it doesn't matter, right? Right. It's just a longer time. Right. You're right. The speed is <laughs> required. Right. right. In fact, Ed from Steelman Town told me that the wicker caskets actually take a couple of years to decompose versus the, uh, the pine boxes. How long does pine take? It's quicker. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so are there any green, purely green burial places in Massachusetts? Okay, are there any all green burial places in Massachusetts? No, not right yet, unfortunately. Um, what is the closest? There are two, three up in Maine. Um, Connecticut's also working on it. Um, there's some just over the border in, in New York. But, uh, yeah. I don't understand your question. Um, like the German quote was, you know, the place in Steel 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 there are three types of burial grounds in the green world. One is called the hybrid burial ground, and that's what Mount Auburn Cemetery is, where they do conventional burials, but also there's a collection of graves that are sectioned off for just the natural burials. So that's called the hybrid. That's what that table related to Greenville, Massachusetts, what we're finding is that it's easier to implement some green graves in town cemeteries rather than find a conservation parcel, which is another type of cemetery that doesn't look like a cemetery. Yeah. What, what is your hope in the future for finding conservation areas? Well, initially in 2014, Greenville, Massachusetts did a survey of about 500 people and um, because we thought, oh, we'll find some place in the center of the state and people will flock to it. And uh, that's not how it works. What we discovered is people like to be buried near where they lived. So my personal goal would be to see one of these conservation type cemeteries in every single county, you know, or some place where people can identify, ah, that's my area. Um, so yeah, we've been at it for one, one of the land trusts we've worked with over five years already. And uh, it, it's just really hard to find property, sadly. <laughs> and, and ideally, also in the conservation burial ground world, they want conservation burial land connected to some other type of conservation land to create wildlife corridors to, you know, travel from New Jersey through New York through Connecticut, and, you know, all the way up to Maine. So that's sort of the goal, also, to be able to preserve millions of acres. And use your body to do that. Do you have data about the decomposition of a body and the pollution that creates, as opposed to all those other uh, and all the concrete and embalming um, fluid? Um, no, but th I think that's my next my next. Um, research project. Because um, you have to prove this is well, better for the environment. Well, what we know is that it's not polluting things, right? We, we, we don't have any reports of people being dug up or well water or public water supplies being provided. And we, we've asked across the country on that kind of stuff. So, um, I've been working on trying to get green burial going in my town of Westford, and so we presented to our Board of Health, and they know a lot about groundwater and <laughs> polluting of the soil, because they're dealing with septic system all the time, and, and the environmental director for the Board of Health basically said, for a body you might get like maximum 12 gallons of fluid, but it gets dissipated right in the soil, whereas like a septic system you might get like a day in some cases, you know. <laughs> so they 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 had no problem. They approved it unanimously. Um, so, yeah, I would, it, it, the soil is an incredible filter. 
and uh, that's what it's sort of designed to do. And um, yeah, th thank you, Lisa, for, for adding that. Um, yes. So what's the experience in other countries? Are there some other countries that are much further along this road? Um, the, the UK has been doing it for a long time. Um, and uh, yeah. So here in the States, we're, we're practically the only country that does embalming. So it's, uh, it, it, it's almost not even a question for other countries. But they're all naturally green. Well, I wouldn't say they're all naturally green. You know, some people, I think Italy's still using lead lined um, um, coffins. But um, yeah, we're the ones who, who are really polluting. Next question for Kat. If you wanted to do some funeral, what are the, and you want to tell your relatives, what are their um, resistance going to be? <laughs> yes, um, because it's people just assume that it's not legal, it's not practical, and there's the ick factor. <coughs> um, usually, I mean, what I've seen is um, depends on person to person, but with good information and education, and especially with the person there who wants this, to get them over the obstacle of, and open their mind. Uh, oftentimes, families come around. But it, it is really a conversation that we like to have in advance. Um, you don't want to have that conversation on the stress. You, know? you don't want anyone to come in and be surprised, like, what? And if, so uh, you can imagine that. Uh, but it's really very straightforward. And, and again, we've done it for so long, people have forgotten that. When you remind them of this, um, it, common sense it makes common sense. Um, I think you have any stories about that. Um, no, it's just, yeah, it's important to have all the decision Thank makers you. there at that initial conversation. I'm, I'm concerned about the logic of um, calling it green to permanently commit a piece of land. Um. Uh, and I, I, I don't know how much land can ever be committed permanently uh, before the extinction of the human race. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, you might say that the, the, the fact that extinction is coming uh, is some comfort in some ways. <laughs> to some, yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Suppose we had a permanent human, human society. What's going on? How do we... How do we keep finding more and more and more land for yeah. uh, um, burial? Well, in that case, it sense. would be green to. In, in that case, it would be. If that's a concern, it would be best. Isn't there this thing about um, ten years ago was the point when there were as many people living as people have ever, as humans have ever died in the history of humankind? Mm -hmm. We we hit that point where now there's. Mm -hmm that many people alive that have been buried, died on, on this planet. So population, yeah, of course, is an issue. But in that case, yeah. natural burial would solve the issue. Yes, yeah, so, so what's interesting, in the state of Massachusetts, only bloodlines can go into the same grave. So um, we're not allowed to put unrelated people into the same grave. But ideally, you'd, you'd want to be able to you know, maybe move the bones and put somebody else in. Um, we can't do that yet in the state of Massachusetts. Yes. Husband and wife and children who are adopted are not bloodline. Um, sorry, but 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 they are legally able to do it. Um, <laughs> they are legally or they're not? They are, yes. Even yeah. though they're not bloodline. Right. Um, and the adopted children who are not bloodline. That they, they can also go in. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, you're saying one grave yeah. and accept more than yeah. one person. Yeah. Yes, it, 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 it could. It, yeah. <laughs> And, and it depends on the depth to groundwater also. You don't want to bury people in the water table. You still want people above the water table. Um, but it, it's, it's possible. It doesn't typically get done, but it's possible. That's in the States. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and I was just going to say, you know, right now, um, 
where we have uh, cemeteries, we have these lines of granite tombstones. Is that really going to be our legacy? You know, uh, and so for me, having the open space is a much kinder legacy than having rows of tombstones. <coughs> and so I do. I, I'm, I'm confused by your, your use of the word green. Um, no, I, I, I hate the tombstones too. So the, the, the question is about the permanent commitment of land. Uh -huh. It doesn't have anything to do with the tombstones. Okay. It's, it's still the. Uh, you say that more people now living than ever died before, but so where are they going to all be buried? Right. Right. And, and you know, that means we have to double all of the cemetery space, and that land is permanently gone. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I prefer to think of it as consuming permanently world. protected. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Just two more questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so I was trying to like put two in one. Um, so, so one is, um, what are the environmental impact of embalming? And just because it's 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 highly chemical, probably, or, or and it will go into the soil. Uh, and the other question was, um, and it's <laughs> now eluding me. Um, that was that. Never mind. You have our contact. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll come back. Uh, so, embalming fluid. Uh, has formaldehyde in it. It's a small percentage, but still it's formaldehyde in it. When a funeral director embalms somebody, they actually have to suit up with personal protective gear. I mean, it, it's toxic to them. There's a higher rate of cancer for those people than for the rest of us. Um, and um, I was just talking with Trish over here, who also does um, home funerals. She uh, used to work with the EPA and pointed out a book to me about um, phytoremediation, so using plants to uptake chemicals. And um, there's a chapter in that book about cemeteries. So I just remember seeing an image of a plume, underground plume, related to I don't know what chemical, but you know, from the varnishes on the, the wood to the, the metals and what we used to use arsenic to um, embalm people during the Civil War. So there's those kinds of chemicals are in fact leaching into the soil. Um, that's known. And my question came back. <laughs> um, so um, what would be the implications? Um, I think you mentioned you couldn't have a green burial like close to a farm. Uh, with, with what? Close to a farm. Like, um, like sorry. Uh, what I meant to say is in Massachusetts, farmland is a priority. So if there's a parcel that's up for sale, but it's farmable land, oh, okay. we can't put a cemetery on it. Okay. So if if you like to have like your burial in like an like an apple tree or something like that, that yeah. would be edible after. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. I just wanted to thank both of you for coming out. It's been a great presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I learned an awful lot. Um, it's uh, very important stuff to continue to talk about. Um, I have a, a specific question um, about Jewish burial. And yeah. if you have any, anything specific pertaining to Jewish burial. I, a friend of mine is Lisa Berenson. She's on the Jewish Cemetery Committee. Um, Here in town? Uh, no. Um, okay. Like, um, it's, it's like J-Cam? Yes, J-Cam. Okay. Yep. Exactly that. Yep. Um, and so she, she administers many of the different cemeteries. And we've been talking about this. And I just wondered if there's anything available um, for Jewish people. Um, so in a, typically, even now in a Jewish cemetery, even though a shrouded burial or a plain pine box is typical for a Jewish burial, right. most Jewish cemeteries also require the concrete box. But 75% of the bottom of the box is cut out, so at least the body's coming in contact with the soil, but they're still using this because they all have landscape lawn cemeteries. Right. Um, so, um, in fact, I'm going to talk to Temple Israel next week in, okay. in, in Brooklyn. Um, so, I, I'd be, if you want to connect us, I'd be I think we should. Yeah. Yep, that would be great. Yep, great. And it's 9 o'clock. You guys are closing up. Right. Thank you. Thank you.